Well, thank you for returning to this class on spiritual gifts that is being produced by the Trinity Video Seminary. Yesterday, we talked about the Holy Spirit and His role in ministry. The Spirit is probably the most neglected member of the Trinity. And because of that reason, it's important for us to understand His ministry. Among the many things He does, He is the power source. He's the one who allows us to live the Christian life. In session six today, we'll begin our expository study of the various passages that deal with spiritual gifts. And so I'll ask those of you in the classroom and those of you who are watching by uh, DVD, please to open in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We will be spending most of our time over the next few days in this passage, next few sessions. In the fall of 2003, my wife and I went to a session that was conducted by some of our friends who had just returned from Angola and wanted to share about their trip. I have to admit that when I went, I thought they were going to tell us what I did on my summer vacation. I was really in for a surprise. As my wife and I sat in the back of the room, they showed a videotape. And suddenly, I learned a little bit of the background of the country of Angola. At that time, I was pretty sure Angola was in Africa, but I couldn't tell you where. And my own personal view of Africa was summed up in the song, Lord, please don't send me to Africa. I was in for a surprise there, too. I watched the video, and at one point, they showed a picture of a group of older men who were sitting in a circle and talking with each other. And the narrator said, this group of men are former members of uh, professions in the country of Angola. Now they're in a UN refugee camp in the country of Zambia. And all they do all day long is to wait for their next meal. Well, something happened in my heart. I saw myself with those men. I said, I'm a highly paid, highly educated professional like they are. If things were different, I could be in that circle. This was a new thought for me. It was the first time I recognized that how blessed I was to be born in America and how had God chosen a different path for my life I might have been in a different country. So I made the mistake of telling my friend leading the meeting that I'd had this emotional response. And he said, well, why don't you and your wife come to our fundraiser, which we're holding the next month? He said, now you don't have to pay any money. You'll be our guest, sit at our table, give money if you want, but don't feel obligated. So we went to the meeting and the guest speaker was a pastor from the country of Angola. And he told us a little bit about the history of the country. So I learned something of its background, which I had not known before. It was a Portuguese colony for about a century. And in the early 1960s, there was a war of independence and the Portuguese left. Unfortunately, the Portuguese didn't leave behind a government to rule the country. Where there's a power vacuum, Two groups will come in and they'll fight. This is often the case in Africa. And so those in the big cities, the haves, fought against those out in the rural areas, the have-nots. And the war lasted 27 years. Can you imagine being in a country fighting a war for 27 years and they blew apart everything? There was nothing left in the country. It was devastated. No schools, no hospitals, no road, no government, no medical facilities, no sanitation, no communication. It was in desperate need of assistance. And then the pastor went on to tell his personal story. And he began by saying, I wish to tell you about the night the soldiers came. And then he told us about the middle of the night when out of nowhere the soldiers came into his village and they came with machine guns ready to kill and to rape and to steal and to burn. And this man got his family, got out of his hut and got into the tall grass 
and he thought we're safe. And then the soldiers came to the tall grass with machetes. And they had to flee back into the forest. And from there they just kept on running until they crossed the river to Zambia. The only problem is the river is filled with crocodiles. And many of the people did not make it across the river. I had never heard of such a thing. And my heart was breaking for these people who were going through such tragic circumstances. Well, that was unusual for me too. Then in November of 2003, the senior pastor's wife had just come back from a trip to the southern part of Africa, and she was impassioned about the pandemic of AIDS taking place in that region, where many people were dying every day of the AIDS disease, and she wanted us to do something. I attend a very large church where if you sit in the back, you must look at the screens to be able to see what's going on on the stage. And so at one point, she looked right at the camera and she said, we have so much, you have so, they have so little. What are you doing? What are you doing to help out in Africa? And I said, I give up, Lord. <laughs> I, I don't understand this, but I said, please don't send me to Africa and for some reason you want me to go. And I turned to my wife and I said, honey, I don't understand this, but God's calling me to Africa. And she, as wives often do, looked at me and said, I know. And if he's calling you, you better go. She died one week later. And so, in the midst of that dark period in my life, the only thing that kept me going was knowing that for some reason God had called me to Angola. And furthermore, my wife, one week prior to her death, had commissioned me to go. And my life has never been the same again. God enlarged my heart with compassion for those who are in undeveloped countries, who lack the basic resources, who have so little when I have so much. And yet, when I went there, they taught me so much more than I taught them. And I saw that they had a joy, a contentment in their life in the Lord that I often don't have. I have more than I can use in a lifetime. And I often do not feel content. I think I'll be happy if I just have a little bit more. But when I get just a little bit more, I'm no happier. How could these people be happy and they have nothing? My life has been marked by that challenge ever since. Well, as we begin our study, my little story about Angola points out you need to know something about the background, the context of where you are going. Even when I did not know I was going, God gave me some information that I would need later to understand the circumstances in Angola, much different than anything I had ever experienced in the nice suburbs of Chicago. So as we turn to 1 Corinthians 12 and we begin our expository study, let's also begin our trip by looking at the background of the city of Corinth. And it's not a pretty picture. At that time, Corinth was a major city. It was very cosmopolitan, quite diverse, socially, culturally, religiously, including the fact that there were many Jewish people living in the city. It was a major seaport and a major trade center. Now you probably are, know of the country of Panama and the Panama Canal where that country is located on one side by the Atlantic, on the other side by the Pacific, and so it is very favorable for trade. Ships drop their goods off on one side, they're carted across to the other side, and they go on. Later they built the canal and the, now the ship can just go through. That's what it was like in Corinth. They had one sea, the Aegean Sea, on one side, and they had the Sea of Corinth on the other. And so ships could drop their goods off at, at Corinth 
and then ship them on to Rome without having to go around Greece. Corinth was also a major political center. It was a Roman colony, and in fact, it was the capital city of uh, the whole area of Achaia, Achaia, which today we know as modern Greece. It was filled with idolatry. It was filled with immorality. In fact, they have found that there were 12 temples to gods within uh, that city. And probably the most famous was to the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love, who really was the goddess of sex. So there were temple prostitutes who the people would go to, and in some perverse way, by having relations with a prostitute, you are worshiping your God. That's how immoral the city was at that time. The church in the city was no better. It was made up largely of Gentiles with some Jewish people. Paul had established the church in his secondary, second missionary journey, but once he left, everything fell apart. And now they were fighting, and now they were divided, and now they couldn't agree, and now they were engaging in immorality. They were engaging in backbiting. They were using the communion table as an excuse for gluttony. And there were some in the church who said, we have to contact Paul. And so the whole epistle of 1 Corinthians is basically some questions the Corinthians have and some answers Paul gives them. And one of the areas they asked about was about spiritual gifts. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Now, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in this first session, session 6 of our expository study, we're only going to look at 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 3. When you do an expository study, you must take more time in order to understand what the verses are saying, verse by verse, which is what the expository approach means. When we look at the first verse, right away, things jump out at us about that church and about our church today in modern times. Verse 1 says, Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, when he begins, now, about spiritual gifts, it's clear somebody asked him a question about spiritual gifts. And so he's kind of going through question by question. On his list, he comes to, okay, here's the question on spiritual gifts. Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant about it. Do you know there's only a few times in Scripture where the phrase, I do not want you to be ignorant about something appears? Only three. One, do not be ignorant about spiritual gifts. And then when you look back at Romans 11.25, which we will not go to, but I encourage you to look at that, Paul in Romans writes, don't be ignorant about God's plan for Israel because Israel plays a pivotal role in the whole history of the, of the world. And as we know, the final battle, the battle of Armageddon, the return of Christ and the second coming, all will take place in the Middle East and all will take place in God's beloved country of Israel. So Paul there writes, don't be ignorant about this plan. It's very important for you to understand. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, he says, And oh, by the way, don't be ignorant about the second coming. Here's how it's going to happen. And this is the famous passage where he talks about uh, Christ coming and that those who are dead in Christ will rise first and then thus those who are alive will also arrive and be with him in heaven forever and the battle to follow. So three times in scripture and only three times does it say, don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant about God's plan for Israel. 
Don't be ignorant about the second coming and do not be ignorant about sp spiritual gifts. Well, unfortunately, even in today's church, we're ignorant about spiritual gifts. I have been a Christian for 35 years. Since 1987, I have attended my current church. But for 12 years prior to that, I went to a church uh, that never preached about spiritual gifts. I don't remember one sermon. I don't remember one adult Bible study that talked about this whole concept of spiritual gifts. And I don't think my experience is alone. I think in most of our churches today, this is a topic that's never addressed from the pulpit. Or if it's addressed, it's addressed only one time and then we move on to what is viewed as more important messages on salvation of people, of living the Christian life. But the most important part of really living the Christian life is first the Holy Spirit and then because He is the Holy Spirit, the spiritual gifts that He gives to us. We know very little about it. I've referred to George Barna before, Christian researcher, probably the preeminent researcher in all the world about the Christian life and what people believe, what people are doing. In 2007, he conducted a study of spiritual gifts. And it actually was the second time that he had studied spiritual gifts. About uh, 10 years before, in 1997, he came out with his first study and things had not changed at all. Barna estimates that 8% of the U.S. population are evangelicals who believe the Bible is the Word of God. It is true in every word of the Bible that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for our sins and to know salvation, you must accept Christ as your personal Savior. Well, not all people who call themselves Christians believe those things. But in my country of America, it's estimated that 8% of the people are what is called evangelical Christians. Now, I recognize that I'm using statistics from America. Those are the only statistics I have. But I kind of doubt that they're any different than the statistics in any other country in the world. In fact, the statistics in other countries may even be worse. So now I have some good news and I have some bad news. When Barnes took his study, he found that 99% of evangelical Christians had heard of spiritual gifts. Yay, God! And now it doesn't get so good. 21% of the 99% said, I have a gift, and then mentioned a gift not in the Bible. Here are some of the gifts that these people, this 21% said that they have. I have the gift of a sense of humor. See, I didn't find that anywhere in scripture, but okay. I have the gift of singing. Well, singing is a gift. It blesses us, but it's actually an ability. It's not a spiritual gift. I, thank God, have the spiritual gift of health. Well, I'm glad for you, but it's not a spiritual gift. Much like happiness. Great that you're happy, but a gift? Mm, I don't think so. And then, just some final ones. I have the gift of compromise. I have the gift of premonition. I have a sense that something's going to happen. And that must be a spiritual gift. And one person said, I have the gift of creativity. I'm very creative. And then my personal favorite, all-time favorite, is I have the personal spiritual gift of bowling. Bowling is a sport with a ball that you roll down a long lane of shiny wood and you have these pins, these kind of uh, long pieces of wood that are arranged in a triangle and you knock it over. The spiritual gift of bowling? I don't think so. All right, so maybe that 99% is more like 78% actually know about spiritual gifts. 
uh-oh, more bad news. 62% couldn't name even one gift. So now we're down to just 16% of the people who know about spiritual gifts. You know, I conducted some research on my own in the Chicago area where I live because I thought, this just can't be true. There's got to be more people who know something about spiritual gifts. Certainly in Chicago where there are many churches preaching the gospel. So I sent a survey to a hundred pastors and I tried to identify people in each church who had the responsibility of placing people in volunteer positions. Those people were most likely to know about spiritual gifts and then try to match up the gift with the position. Made sense. Well, I only had 21 people respond. So this isn't completely, you know, uh, the end-all be-all of research. But actually, to send out to 100 people and get 21 to respond is pretty good. So these 21 people, they work in a church. And they are responsible for placing volunteers. They should know. Well, I asked the volunteers, how important is it for your people to know about spiritual gifts? And those people, 84% said it's very important. Now the other 12 said it's important, but 84% said very important. And that's the one I was looking at. Then I asked a second question. How many people in your church actually know their spiritual gift? 6%. There's about 78% difference between those two numbers. 86% say, 84% say very important. 6% actually know it. There's a gap which shows how ignorant we are of spiritual gifts. So as we go on in verses 1 through 3, you know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute, to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Okay, wait a minute. Why all of a sudden this thing about idols? I mean, it seems like he just drops this out of nowhere. What he's saying is, you people have made spiritual gifts an idol. An idol is anything or anyone that you place above God. In our day, it tends to be money or fame or power or position or possessions. And Paul's saying, here's the problem in your church. You're fighting each other about certain spiritual gifts, like leadership, are way up here. And certain gifts like helps are way down here. So guess who the people were in the church who are very important? The people with leadership. And so they're fighting each other back and forth. And Paul reminds them, don't you remember before you came to Christ, you worshiped idols and you learned that idols are nothing but a piece of stone. They're just something. And he's saying, Spiritual gifts are just some thing. You're to worship someone, the God of all creation. He's reminding them to go back. And then, because false teachers were spreading these rumors, he gives them a test and he says, okay, false teachers, wolves in sheep clothing are going to come in and they're going to teach stuff like this. So here's a test for you. Nobody can say Jesus is Lord except that the Holy Spirit is with them. If they say Jesus be cursed, then they can't be a Christian. And we find that this is true today. People who do not believe in the Son of God, do not believe he's the only way of salvation, cannot admit that Jesus is Lord. And so it is a wonderful test uh, that Paul has given us uh, that we should use today. Well, as we look at uh, today's session, we looked first at, don't be ignorant about spiritual gifts. 
And I applaud all of you in this class and those of you who are watching by DVD. You're not being ignorant. You're taking steps to know about spiritual gifts, a very important, although neglected, part of the Christian life. And so as we continue, remember that ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance leads to the abyss. If you're ignorant, you can't be happy because you don't know the truth. And if you continue that way, you're going to fall off a cliff. Your life will never be fulfilled. You will never be happy because you're not living the truth. And the truth says that by the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts have been given and they've been given to be used. Well, what other problems do, do the Corinthian church have? And what's Paul's advice going to be to the Christian church there? And that's the subject of our next session.